I want to share one thing that's really cool about the anim school thing is how much I struggled. So you guys should definitely know that every animator continues to struggle and push through different areas and have difficulties. So I'm going to show a quick part that I was really struggling with. So I wanted to talk about as I was splatting the shot and specifically talking about the ending and the transition of him getting up. Let's talk about what it looked like when I was final blocking, okay? So final blocking, I just kind of blocked in him doing a quick windmill, standing up. He looks around just with his head, sees the apple, kicks it up, and just stands there in this like Ichabod type crane pose. And when I started to spline it, I realized, all right, there's a almost a phrase for it is like the animation magazine cover. This like one hand on the hip, cocked eyebrow type thing. And I realized I was doing that, the hands on the hips type thing. I didn't find it appealing and found it boring. So I wanted to find something else for the ending. And also, I felt like him looking around with just his head, I felt like his, it was very boring with his arms and that kind of stuff. So I, I needed to find a better way. I wanted to find a cartoonier transition up. So I tried this. And this, so this is my first attempt at saying, what else can I do? And this is almost spline blocking right through here. He's just moving around, really rudimentary, just shifting around. And I was like, okay, would that be cool? Do I have time to do that? So I dug that, and then I was also starting to block in the ending pose, which I thought was a lot cooler, the super, super relaxed. I think it harkens back to the way he starts in Chip Shot, the one where he's sleeping and slowly falling asleep. He's just sort of this lazy, boring guy. So I thought that'd be really great to go ahead and put in there and, you know, bite the apple as he's going through. But I, they still had the problem that the transition wasn't working. So I had to load up another one. So I tried this huge thing where his head leads the smear, so I thought there would be an arc this way and go down, and his head would completely smear, and then his legs would smear, and then his foot would continue that arc. So I was trying to paint this arc around here like this and stretching the foot to try to get that arc to read. And in the end, I abandoned that as well because it just was not reading. It wasn't reading as an arc to me. See that? All right, so we're talking about smear frames, and the reason why you want to do a smear frame is because something is either strobing or it's not clear, the spacing in between is so great that the eye can't make that connection, especially when you're not relying on motion blur at all. So I put in these stretch frames to make that clear. But now, since it's so stretched, it actually slowed the timing down so much, it now stole some of that snappiness away. So once again, I had to abandon that idea as well and try a new idea. This one looks about the same, but the, I think the ending... So th now I'm exploring a little bit like how these transitions can happen. So I'm stretching the arms, I'm stretching the face, because I only have like one frame to really get over. So I have a quick antic pose, and then a smear over, and then a quick settle, and that's all I have time for. And then exploring exactly how to grab the apple. So there's a little quick smear of the hand just to help fill in the gaps that I'm missing without motion blur. I will agree that even these could have been a little bit cooler or flashier if it was like multiple limbs and that kind of stuff, but it just came down to time. So I didn't put any of that stuff in. So again, I still didn't feel like it was working. So I'm, now I'm really struggling. I'm burning some serious time figuring out how to do these transitions because I just wasn't satisfied. Here's another one. So here I try to like a quick popping at the end because I wanted to feel like he quickly settled and to me this really looked like garbage. In terms of how that hand is coming up, it's very even. I'm just experimenting to see what would happen if the head shook at the end there because I was looking for just a little texture in there and it was way too much texture. It was losing the snappiness of it. But while I'm doing that, I'm also exploring exactly how the apple is caught and needing to smear the apple with the hand Again, because, you know, I'm playing with the, the spacing and the timing of that. The ending is now a lot more explored and in-depth and showing exactly how I think he can move. And I think that's really working. This is one of the rare occasions that if I was in production and I knew this was going to hit film, this last section I would have gone back into the reference room just to make sure. Because I have a strong conviction that you should definitely at least give reference a shot. Even if you think you can do it on your own, like I feel like I'm not doing my due diligence as a professional animator and because, you know, Blue Sky's paying me enough that I feel like I better put in every single ounce of effort to make sure this is going to look as good as possible. And by not running into that reference room for just five minutes, that's all it takes, get my iPhone out and stand in front of the mirror for five minutes, then maybe I shouldn't be paid as much as I am because I'm not putting in every single effort and exploring every avenue to make this as best as possible. 
So that's why I would have gone in to shoot this reference, but due to just timing issues, this was a fast production shot for Adam School that I can have some fun and actually just explore it without reference, which is something that I don't get to do very often. So I felt like, eh, I'm going to try to feel like a real animator <laughs> almost and just play with it myself. Here's the next version. So now I want to nail this smear frame. Here's a lot more what I was looking for. I wanted just a quick little fly up. All I wanted was a flash to the audience that all of a sudden he's getting up. I didn't really care how it was articulated. So I just did this quick arc. So I think to the audience it just reads that there's a flash up not it's his legs going up or anything else it's just a flash up so that's what I went ahead and went with and what I really was important was sticking him here in the air for a little bit and even this it's a little crazy in terms of how it, the windmill is going but it's got a lot more of what I was looking for in terms of a quick bit of texture and then popping into the pose I'm hitting a quick pose of anger that reads just for a couple frames and then really doing these transitions and what really helps sell these ideas of in only having those two frames to do the transition is really using those animation principles of secondary motion around with the extremities of using the lapel and the jacket and the hair to add that little settle and that's all it really needs. This rig is cool that there's so many of those little extra controls that are very high production value that you can go ahead and add those little subtle things in there. So adding that little motion to the clothes made all the difference. So this is when I was finally completely satisfied, which is the final frames here. All the textures there, all the smear frames are there. It's not overly strobing anywhere for me. And if there is any strobing, I feel like it's, it was an intentional bit of texture. Strobing is not always a bad thing. It just kind of creates a pop or a flash. And to be fair, I like a little bit of dirt in uh, animation now as well. I think every animator kind of goes through their waxing and waning in terms of what they like and how dirty or how clean or how much they want to finesse their arcs. So right now in my career, I like a little bit of dirtiness. So were all the smear frames actually done within the rig? And yes, I didn't add any secondary lattices or anything. So everything that you saw in my test was completely done within the rig. I didn't want to do any special stuff. Like some of the other shots that you saw had multiple characters brought in for multi-limb. So what you saw in my shot is one character with just the rig controls. Nothing like proprietary blue sky-ish or anything like that. I see people use smear frames in a way that uh, isn't super helpful. Sort of execute them in a way that doesn't really work. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to like you're trying to get a specific feel of how fast something is moving. And the one thing I see people mess up all the time is they think smear frame means zippy. Like now it's going to move fast, which smear frames are almost doing the exact opposite. They one primarily take care of strobing, so something is supposed to read better. That's one thing they're used for. Or two, they actually slow down your animation because you're seeing it actually articulate around a certain motion. So, you know, you're actually seeing this hand completely move. It's almost like the fingers are staying, like if my hand is moving across the screen, and if those fingers actually smear and stay back here, then you're actually feeling that hand longer, which then slows it down. So if you're trying to be zippy, well, you're, you're ruining the zippiness, and you're doing it for the exact wrong reason. If let's talk about even professional animators screwing it up, which is they want to add a smear frame, and we are at work, we're using motion blur on top of it. So they're making this beautifully articulated smear frame when motion blur is going to be added on top and just ruin it. And all they had to do was rely on the motion blur to get that exact same feeling. And you're actually just seriously wasting production money. It's <laughs> something that I am obsessed with, which is not only screwing with smear frames, but is actually manipulating motion blur. And that is my passion and my love at Blue Sky because I feel like... One, on Rio, I got the production to change how motion blur calculates at Blue Sky because I thought it was calculating backwards or taking sample frames from the wrong way. So by having them change it to the way I thought animators would find it more useful and then teaching that to the animators, we actually are constantly paying attention to what our final motion blur will look like. At least the way it works at most studios is that any given frame is a composite of two different images and then just a smear between that. So if you're only paying attention to those whole frames, you're only actually paying attention to 50% of what your final animation is going to look like, which is a scary thought. You're allowing the computer to, to basically determine what half your animation is going to feel like.